Hey everybody, welcome to the 25th edition of Keep Looking Up. Today we are going to be traveling to the outer reaches of the solar system and we are going to be visiting Pluto and the Kuiper Belt with our planetarium alum that is uh, the one and only Eleni Hunsig who's going to be joining us. Say hello, Eleni. Hello, thank you for having me. Happy to have you back and uh, looking forward to your talk this evening. Also, to be here. this evening and helping with the star talk is going to be Aubrey. Uh, she's going to be uh, assisting us, even though we are getting to crunch time in the semester. Uh, she's uh, got the world on her shoulders there and ready to pick up. And uh, last but certainly not least, helping us out tonight is the one, the only, Patricia. And I'm sorry to say for us anyway, great for Patricia, this is her last official act as a member of the Ward Beecher Planetarium because she graduates on May 6th and is heading to grad school away from w YSU, uh, looking uh, at several programs. So uh, we'll be seeing her down. She's going to be helping us out with our comments and uh things like that. Uh, so if you got any questions or anything as we go along, as we go through, if you have questions for either Aubrey, Eleni, or myself, uh, please put them in the comments. Uh, we will share them. Uh, if not during the show, we will get them during the uh, um, question and answer session at the end. But share your comments there. Uh, we'll be happy to have them. So we are going to start tonight uh, with a uh, look at the uh, uh, nighttime sky. Before we get to that, though, uh, by the way, Eleni and Patricia, we'll see you again in a moment. Uh, before we get to that, though, a uh, couple of updates. Number one, no update on the planetarium yet. All our paperwork has been submitted to the insurance company. We're still waiting to hear back as how much money we're going to get. Once we know when the money's coming, then we know when work begins on the planetarium. Uh, we do know that the dome is coming down, and we do know that the total bill is going to be somewhere uh, in the seven-figure range. But we don't have exact numbers yet, so still no word on uh, when things will get started or when we'll be back live in the planetarium, I'm afraid. But on much more pleasant news, uh, I have two mission updates to bring you. Uh, first happened very, very early this morning. The European Space Agency uh, launched on an Ariane 5 rocket, a mission called JUICE. Uh, this uh, is a rocket uh, that, is, uh, that is in uh, conjunction with NASA and the Japanese space agency JAXA. Uh, it, JUICE is a very contrived uh, um, acronym. Somehow they got JUICE out of Jupiter's Icy Moons Explorer. That's uh, what this mission's doing. Uh, it's going to take eight years to get out to Jupiter. It's going to uh, circle Jupiter a few times, do some imagery with uh, Jupiter, but we already have Juno doing that. It's going to concentrate on the three icy moons of Jupiter. Those are Europa, uh, Callisto, and eventually it is going to go into orbit around the biggest moon in the solar system. That is the moon Ganymede. Ganymede is actually bigger than the planet Mercury. And uh, so we're going to get some research of that within the next decade, which is going to be really exciting. So we're happy that mission is off. Uh, second and also really big news, uh, SpaceX has finally gotten clearance for their Starship to launch. If you haven't heard about Starship, this is bigger than the Artemis rocket. Uh, it's going to be the most powerful rocket ever made when it finally takes off. The actual Starship itself on top of the rocket uh, is going to be big enough to take people to the moon and Mars. And Elon Musk says it's going to be so big, there's actually going to be state rooms for the astronauts plus common areas within the rocket. It's going to be able to lift more than any other rocket ever. And they're doing an unmanned, its first unmanned launch this Monday, uh, Eastern time. It's between 8 and 11 a.m. sometime. Uh, they're launching from South Padre Island uh, down near Brownsville, Texas. Uh, so keep your eyes peeled for that. It should be a spectacular launch. 
when it happens. So uh, with that, we will move on to the current night sky. I just have to do a little fancy screen sharing and talk at the same time. I do this at the planetarium all the time, though, so it's not too difficult. So we're going to uh, bring up Stellarium here. This is a free planetarium program that uh, anyone can um, uh, download and uh, look at the nighttime sky. And I know the past several nights have been absolutely spectacular uh, to look at the nighttime sky tonight. Not so much because, of course, when we go on the air, it clouds up. But you are going to get some other nice nights, especially now that it's getting warm. Uh, some great nights to go out and look at the nighttime sky. I'm sure many of you have been wondering what that incredibly bright thing in the western sky is at sunset. And if you look over here, that's right here. Here, it is the third brightest object in the entire sky. That is the planet Venus in the nighttime sky. Uh, only the sun and the moon are brighter than Venus, so very easy to spot. Uh, this is tonight at 9 o'clock, I should point out, because uh, if you notice, if you look out your window right now, it's not completely dark out there. Sunset wasn't until just when we started this show at 8 o'clock. It's not going to get dark enough for you to see anything till about 8.30, so this is about the time we're getting done with the show around 9 o'clock that I'm showing you here with uh, uh, Stellarium. I will note that uh, there's a little cluster of stars right behind Venus here. Those are the Pleiades in the constellation Taurus the Bull, and just a couple of nights ago, Venus skimmed those, uh, and that was uh, quite the photographic moment uh, for Venus uh, in the nighttime sky. There is a second planet in the nighttime sky. Unfortunately, it's not Jupiter, even though Juice took off. That's right behind the sun right now. Uh, but it's up here. That is the planet Mars in the nighttime sky, pretty high up to west. Uh, you won't see that right at a uh, quarter of nine, probably about nine, nine, 15. It'll be dark enough for you to see Mars up in the nighttime sky too. So uh, those are in the western sky, but in the real outside, you probably don't have a great big red W uh, to show you where this stuff is in the nighttime sky. So uh, fortunately, the nighttime sky does give you a way to do that. Uh, so I am going to turn you over to Aubrey, who is going to tell you how we do that. Thank you, Kurt. Yeah, so we're actually going to go across the sky over a bit here. Um, and what you'll probably see most prominently uh, is up in the right corner there, and it is a group of six or seven stars, depending on how, how dark your sky is. Um, and that, of course, is the Big Dipper. Um, it kind of looks like it's about to scoop down for a bunch of stars. Um, and so we can use the top two stars of, of the cup, draw a line diagonally down to the bottom, towards the bottom left, and we'll get to a star called Polaris, which is, of course, the North Star. And it's called that because it is all about directly north. And so we can use that star to know which way we are facing in the night sky. Um, and the Big Dipper is one of those constellations that it is always going around the North Pole where Polaris is, so it never sets. So we can always use the Big Dipper to find Polaris, again, using those top two stars. Um, I do want to actually go back towards the southwest sky because near Venus, we had the bright constellation of the Hunter Orion. And I want to bring this up not only because it's a very common and, and easier constellation to see, but also because he's going to be gone soon. Um, this is kind of his last hurrah uh, before we start to get more towards the spring sky since he's very prominent in the, in the winter sky. So he'll set about 11 o'clock tonight. Um, so hopefully in the next few nights, while it's good weather, you can be able to see him before he truly sets un until we get back to the fall sky uh, in, in several months. Um, but just real quick, I'm going to say there's a star up in the right, or excuse me, in the left of his constellation. It's a bright red star. You might have heard of it. It's called Betelgeuse. Um, and I always like to bring this one up because in Arabic, Betelgeuse means armpit. And as Kurt showed you with the outline, that is, in fact, Orion's armpit. Um, <laughs> so that's always a good thing to know. And that's a really super giant red star there. And then in the bottom right, where his other foot is, um, is Rigel. And that's a very bright blue star as well. Um, and so, yeah, I just want to share that constellation with you guys. And I'm going to give it back over to Kurt to talk about anything else in our 
Southwest Sky uh, before we get to the great presentation by Eleni. Yes, I'll be brief here. Uh, Orion is considered one of our wintertime constellations, hence the reason why it's going to be setting soon. Uh, don't forget to mute your video there, Aubrey. Uh, but I am going to come back over. There's south. There's southeast. We're going to go all the way around to the east. And as I do that, you'll notice here's the Big Dipper again. The Big Dipper is in the northeast. There's the four stars of the cup. There's the three stars of the handle. When the Big Dipper is high in the sky as it is now, uh, we can use the Big Dipper to move around and find lots of other things in the sky. The way we found the North Star, which is right there, that's Polaris again, uh, that's called star hopping. And it's just a fancy way of saying if you know how to find something like the Big Dipper, you can then use it to move around and find lots of other things in the sky. Well, at no time of the year is it easier to use the Big Dipper to star hop than it is right now during the spring. It is a key that will unlock the entire nighttime sky for you. Now, because of the length of our feature presentation, I'm only going to do one star hop for you, uh, but it is a very easy one to do. Uh, we use those two stars to find Polaris. If we take the handle here of the Big Dipper and we follow the curve of the handle or make an arc, we will end up at the fourth brightest star in the entire sky right there. It is called Arcturus. And what we just did is we arced to Arcturus. We astronomers are kind of absent-minded. We need these little things to remember these star hops. We find Arcturus in a constellation I have always had a bit of a problem with called Beutes the Herdsman. Oh, hold on one second here. There we go. That's because I clicked on that earlier. Let me see if I can get it now. There we go. Beutes the Herdsman. Let me see if I can get the name up here. Uh, yes. If I do that. Now, I don't have a problem with Beutes because it's a dumb name. Actually, you can call him Booties if you want to. It's one of the dumbest names in the entire nighttime sky. No, my problem is I don't know any herdsmen. So I don't know what a herdsman is supposed to look like. So when I see Beutes, I usually picture something a bit more familiar. And you guys all live here in Youngstown. You probably will see the same thing. There's Arcturus. That's the base of a cone right here. Uh, here is a scoop of Handel's ice cream on that cone. And everybody knows how big Handel's makes their ice cream cones. It used to be a double-decker cone, but a scoop has fallen off and is lying next to it over here. By the way, the scoop that fell off, this is another constellation. It's a little bitty constellation with a great big name. That little curve there is called Corona Borealis, which means northern crown. Borealis, like Aurora Borealis, of northern Corona, like the beer, means crown. And according to the Greek people in one of their stories, Hercules was supposed to have thrown those stars up there a long time ago. So uh, there you go. That's a couple of things you can check out in the nighttime sky. There is always lots to see in the nighttime sky up there, no matter when you go out. And the sky is constantly changing over your head. So uh, I do encourage you to look at programs like uh, uh, this. Also, when something interesting is going on in the nighttime sky, I do try to share it with you on uh, Facebook uh, so you can see uh, upcoming events and things like that. So stay tuned to our Facebook page and um, we'll happy to be uh, showing you this stuff as we do these keep looking up shows as we go along. But with that, we are going to now go past Jupiter and learn a little bit more about our solar system and some of the uh, other players in the solar system. So I turn it over to you, the great Eleni Hunsik. Thank you, Kurt. It's so good to be back. Um, it's It's been a while. Um, and also, I see a lot of my friends are here watching as well. So thank you guys for tuning in. Um, but without further ado, let's talk a little bit about Pluto. So I'm going to share my presentation here. All right, let's make it full screen. There we go. Okay. All right, so today we're going to be talking all about Pluto and the Kuiper Belt, um, and also the New Horizons mission. So you see here we have Pluto here front and center, um, and then over here to the left is the Kuiper Belt. We'll talk a little bit more about what exactly that is um, later on in the presentation. And then on the right here, we have the New Horizons spacecraft, which taught us all about Pluto and the Kuiper Belt. Um, all right, so 
We're going to answer lots of questions in this talk. I'm sure you guys all have questions um, that you'll think of as we're going through here as well. So if you ever think of a question, feel free to put it in the comments and I'll try and stop throughout um, at good stopping points to answer any questions that you guys might have. Um, but the questions, the main questions I'm going to answer today are how far away is Pluto? Where exactly is Pluto in the solar system? Um, how was Pluto discovered and why do we call it Pluto? Um, here's the big question. Why isn't Pluto a planet anymore? Um, that's probably why most of you guys are here. And that's a big one. That's an important question to talk about. Um, and branching off of that, what is the official definition of a planet? Um, and how do we learn about Pluto now? What is the New Horizons mission? What did we learn from it? What new things have we learned about Pluto in the last decade? What is the Kuiper Belt? Um, and what other interesting objects are in the Kuiper Belt? So the Kuiper Belt is where Pluto lives. You'll see more of that a little bit later on, but there are lots of other interesting things out there as well. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, but before we go into the details about Pluto, um, whenever I'm talking about a planet, especially Pluto, I kind of like to, to talk a little bit about the scale of the solar system, um, especially with Pluto, since it's all the way out there, all the way, way past Neptune. Um, so it's, it's very important to understand how far away it is. So the first thing we're going to look at, um, and the link is in the comments, uh, it is if the moon were only one pixel. This is a really cool website. Um, you should definitely check it out after this talk because to go through this thing in its entirety um, is actually quite tedious. It takes about 20 minutes, so we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time here, um, but this is a very cool site where you can actually scroll through um, and explore the solar system to scale if it were scaled down so that the moon was one pixel. So here you see one pixel, so the moon shrunk down to that size, and then the sun to scale. This is how big the sun would be compared to the moon if we shrunk the whole solar system down so the moon was only one pixel. Um, and like I said, you can take your time and scroll through here after, um, after the show ends. I encourage you to come back to this and scroll through, but it is very tedious. So what we're going to do is pay attention to the bar down at the bottom here, the scroll bar. It goes all the way from the bottom left of the screen to the bottom right of the screen. Um, and that's kind of like our scale model that we're shrunk down to here. So I'm going to start scrolling. And of course, the first planet we will come to from the sun is Mercury. And we get there pretty quickly here. So here's Mercury. Um, and you can see we've kind of barely moved. So sun is in the center. This is a scale model if we took kind of like a cross section of the planet's orbit. So pretend the planets are all in a perfect line. I know the orbits are circular and we'll see kind of what that looks like a little bit better in a minute. Um, but pretend the planets are all perfectly aligned in their orbits. This is just the distance between the orbits of the planets. So we have Mercury first. We're gonna keep on going here and pretty soon we'll come to our next planet, which is Venus. Um, and again, you can see we've barely traveled out from the sun here. So this is the whole solar system from sun all the way out to Pluto in the Kuiper Belt is on this end at the right here. Um, and you can see we've kind of barely moved from the sun and we are already at Venus. And then after Venus, we have Earth, of course. Here we are, Earth and the moon. Um, so this really kind of starts to put things into perspective. So you know how far apart these inner planets are Mercury, Venus, Earth, um, and then Mars, you know, it takes quite a long time to travel um, between there. And in fact, it takes light, the fastest thing in the universe, um, eight minutes to travel from the sun to the Earth. Um, so we just traveled a really big distance um, that takes eight minutes for light to travel, the fastest thing in the universe. Um, just in a few seconds. So we are gonna keep on going. Next is Mars. And you can see down at the bottom left on my scroll bar, we have barely even moved and there's Mars. So there's the four inner planets. All four of the inner planets are in that little tiny space. We've only moved about this far from the center of the solar system. And we still have to make it all the way out to Pluto. So this hopefully gives you an appreciation of how far the New Horizons mission had to travel to get us the wonderful images of Pluto that we have today. So we are going to keep on going. And this is where it starts to get really very tedious. Um, so those were the four inner planets. Um, and of course, after Mars is Jupiter. But in between Mars and Jupiter, we do have the asteroid belt, which does not show up on here because all of the asteroids are smaller than the moon. 
Um, so they would be smaller than a single pixel. So it's not on here, but um, the guy who put this website together does have some commentary. So if you take your time to scroll through this on your own, um, you'll see he does note where the asteroid belt would be if they were big enough to show up on the scale model. So here we're going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Just keep swimming as Dory says, and there's Jupiter. So we are less than a quarter of the way through here and we are already at Jupiter, the fifth planet. And you can see the four Galilean moons of Jupiter are here as well. So hopefully this is giving you a, a bit of an understanding of just how big the solar system is as we keep on going here to our next planet, Saturn. We're probably a little bit more than a quarter of the way out to Pluto now. Here we go. Like I said, very tedious. Here we are. And here is Saturn and Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Um, and we're a little bit more than a quarter of the way through. We're going to keep on going. And the next planet is Uranus. And I'm just going to tell you that's about halfway to Pluto. So we're going to scroll all the way about halfway there. So our seventh planet is already halfway, is only halfway to Pluto. So things seem to get farther and farther apart as we go out. There it is. So here is Uranus. And of course, we have one last planet, and it's not Pluto. More on that later. Um, but if you know what the last planet is after Uranus, go ahead and drop it in the comments, comments, and we will make our way there. So like I said, we're about halfway to Pluto now. Keep going. And here we get to... Where is it? <laughs> Did I pass it? <laughs> Let's see. Where are you, Neptune? Nope. I've gotten to the end. <laughs> We've lost Neptune, guys. It's way out there. It's easy to get lost. Yes, yeah, it's way out there. Space is big. That's the whole the whole thing with this. Is space is very big. So Neptune's out here. Um, it's about a little more than three quarters of the way to Pluto. So it's out here somewhere. When you take your time to scroll through it, you will find it. Um, I really do encourage you, instead of cheating like I am, to actually scroll with your mouse and you will see just how big the solar system is, how long it takes to get all the way out to the edge of the solar system and get to Pluto, which is, that's where this ends. So we have Pluto. <laughs> this is also difficult to do with a trackpad. I recommend using a mouse with a scroll wheel. <laughs> Here's Pluto, there we go. We still love you, Pluto. So here's Pluto. I um, mean, like I said, Pluto lives in the Kuiper Belt, um, which has lots of other objects in there. But again, most of those objects are very small, so they wouldn't show up on this scale model. Um, but that, yeah, that's how long, how far away Pluto is. And we have another website um, that will kind of show you this now as a whole, but I do encourage you to revisit this website. Um, after the talk and take your time to really scroll through it. And he has comments in there throughout. So you're not just scrolling the whole time. Um, you'll get some interesting uh, facts in there as well. Um, but this website now is solarsystem.nasa.gov and we'll put this one in the comments too. Um, and this one, this is a really cool simulation. It's real time. Um, so it shows you where all of the objects in the solar system are now. And you can see just like we saw with our scale model that we just scrolled through, the inner planets are very, very close relatively to the sun. Um, and then they get farther and farther apart as you move out to the outer planets. So we have our inner planets, then we have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Um, and then where's Pluto? Let's see. So Pluto we have right here. So you'll already start to notice Pluto is a little bit different. Um, one of these things is not like the others. You know, it's, it's on an inclined angle here. So looking at 
um, the shape of the solar system, it's flat. It's kind of like a, a pancake. All the planets are on the same plane. Um, but something that makes Pluto and lots of other Kuiper Belt objects unique is that they are kind of all over the place. They don't really follow this rule of being on this plane. Um, but this is another really cool website that I encourage you to check out. You can kind of fly around, you can zoom in, zoom out, um, see different objects in the solar system and kind of where they are relative to one another. Um, we also have the New Horizons mission on here somewhere. It shows you where it's at now. Um, and again, that's the mission that studied Pluto and flew past it um, and now is all the way out here. But back to our presentation. And again, the link to this one's in the comments as well. So I encourage you to play around with it later on. Um, but now let's talk about Pluto. So Pluto is a bit of a controversial topic. Um, so people have kind of debated about whether it's a planet or not um, ever since 2006 when it was kind of officially, um, officially people say demoted, but we still love Pluto. Um, but before we get to why that is, let's just go over a little bit of background about Pluto, a little bit of history um, of Pluto. So first of all, Pluto was discovered at the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, this observatory was established in 1894. It's one of the oldest observatories in the United States. Um, and it was founded by Percival Lowell. Um, it is still open today, so you can go there. Um, it's, it's used both for research and for like public education. So you could go there and, and visit um, and observe there during their designated times for that. So if you're ever in the area, definitely check it out. Um, but the search for Pluto began here, um, and it began in 1906. Um, so why were they searching for another planet? How did they know there was another planet there? Um, well, looking at the orbit of the planet Uranus, uh, scientists had noticed that something had to be influencing its orbit. And at the time, um, Uranus was the last planet. The seventh planet was the last planet. They looked um, and discovered the eighth planet, Neptune. Um, but doing some calculations, the, the discovery of ne Neptune didn't fully account for the irregularities in Uranus's orbit. So the search continued. Um, and the search continued starting in 1906 at, at Lowell Observatory, they were dedicated to finding this ninth planet. Um, so starting in 1906, they were searching. Percival Lowell passed away in 1916. They still hadn't found it. Um, and then finally, a teeny tiny ninth planet was discovered by Clyde Tombaugh in 1930. And he was observing at the Lowell Observatory. Um, and how did he find it? So the way that planets are discovered, um, is it actually started with the ancient Greeks. They looked up at the sky and they noticed these stars, in quotes, um, that appeared to move around the sky. So all of the stars would kind of have a still background, but throughout each night, if you looked at the sky, these strange stars would appear to be in a slightly different place each night relative to all the stars in the background that kind of kept their places relative to each other in their constellations and their shapes. Um, so the word planet comes from the Greek word planetes, which means wander, because these objects appeared to wander across the sky night by night um, across the background of stars. And the reason the planets appear to do that is because these stars in the background are super duper far away from us. Um, so even though we're moving and they're moving, it's negligible because of the huge distance between us and those stars. We don't see that movement. But the planets, relatively, are much closer to us. Um, so as they're orbiting around the sun and we're orbiting around the sun and moving past those planets and those planets are moving past us, we see them appear to move across the background of stars and wander. Um, so that's why we call them planets. Um, and that is also how Pluto was discovered. Uh, Percival Lowell uh, had his team looking at the sky, looking for these objects that appeared to wander and Clyde Tombaugh eventually found one um, and it became the ninth planet. Um, but before we, before we move on, I just wanna point out this picture of Uranus that's on here. Um, 
I'm very excited to share this. This is from the James Webb Space Telescope. I know that Dr. Pat Durrell gave an amazing talk about it last time. So if you missed the last live stream, definitely go back and check it out. Um, but this is a picture from the James Webb Space Telescope of Uranus. And it's a really awesome picture because we have such a clear image of Uranus's rings, um, thanks to JWST's amazing infrared capabilities. Um, so fun fact, all of the gas giant planets, so Saturn, Jupiter, um, Neptune, and Uranus all have rings, um, not just Saturn. Saturns are definitely the, the biggest and most extravagant and most visible, but they all have rings and the, the infrared um, wavelength really allows us to see those rings quite a bit better. So this is like a false color image where you can really see Uranus's rings. And I love that they're visible because you can see that they are actually vertical, whereas with Saturn, they're more like horizontal or tilted. So this shows that Uranus is inclined on its orbit at a 90 degree, degree angle. Um, so it's like kind of on its side. Um, and that is because of a, an early collision um, when the solar system was first forming a large object, hit Uranus, knocked it on its side. Um, and now it's kind of like rolling around the sun at a 90 degree angle. It's very cool. Um, first but those that, rings have been imaged since 1986, I should yeah. point out too. Yes, it's absolutely awesome. Thank you, JWST. Um, but so ninth planet has been discovered, what to call it? Um, so astronomers have always loved asking the public for suggestions on what to name things, um, even back in 1930. Nowadays, you see it with Mars rovers and with exoplanets, which are planets that orbit stars that are not the sun. Um, but back then, they discovered a new planet. So the uh, Lowell Observatory requested um, input from the public on what to name it. So they got over a thousand suggestions. Um, and they ended up going with a name suggested by an 11-year-old girl named Venetia Burney. Um, and that name was Pluto, the Roman god of the underworld. Um, and the Greek equivalent to Pluto is Hades. Um, and she suggested this name because uh, Pluto, probably a cold, dark, gloomy place all the way out there, all the way at the edge of the solar system, so far away from the sun. Um, and also this god was able to make himself invisible and Pluto had been invisible to us for so long. It took so long to find it. Um, so that was a fitting name for it. Um, and it was also fitting because a lot of the, the other planets are named for the Roman gods. Um, and the team at Lowell Observatory liked it because the first two letters were first evil Lowell's initials. Um, so fun fact, all of the planets also have symbols. They're not used so much in astronomy today, but they were used quite a bit back then. Um, they're still used occasionally, but I have uh, a picture of those right over here, and you can see the symbol for Pluto is a P and an L kind of put together um, for Percy Below and for Pluto. Um, and then, of course, Pluto the dog um, came after the planet Pluto, so Pluto the dog was named after Pluto. Um, but I just think that's a very funny juxtaposition um, when you think of the, you know, the god of the underworld, Hades or Pluto. This, this guy doesn't look like the god of the underworld to me, but um, I think it's a still a very cute and fitting name for him and maybe why so many people are attached to the planet Pluto today. Um, and then also shortly after um, Pluto's discovery and naming, um, the element plutonium was named after Pluto. And the reason I bring this up is because I've seen a meme going around recently um, about plutonium that says that plutonium tastes like candy, the element plutonium tastes like candy. Um, don't eat plutonium. This is the this is the meme that I've seen going around. Um, but plutonium is a radioactive element. Do not eat plutonium. And I don't even know where this comes from. There's only one documented instance of somebody tasting plutonium. It was a chemist who was working in a lab um, and the plutonium actually splashed on his face and some of it got in his mouth. Um, and he, he reported it as having a metallic taste, um, not a candy-like taste, so I don't know where that comes from. Um, and he had to have his stomach pumped, so please do not eat plutonium. That is space PSA. <laughs> but back, before, before we get back to Pluto, are there any questions? Nothing yet on the comments, but please, everyone, if you have questions as Eleni goes on, write them in the comments and we will share them with Eleni so she can answer them for you. Yes, thank you. All right. 
So now on to the big question, Pluto's reclassification. Why is Pluto not a planet anymore? Um, so since Pluto's discovery, it's been suspected uh, that there were a lot of objects near Pluto um, that just hadn't been discovered yet, were maybe too small to see, we weren't looking in the right places or in the right way or whatever. Um, so we already we already knew about plant or about comets, I'm sorry, um, because comets would go all the way out to the outer solar system near Pluto and come past Earth. They have highly elliptical orbits. Um, so we knew there was stuff out there. Where did the where did the comets come from? They had to come from something. There had to be some material out there. Um, so what else could could there be? Um, and later on, of course, the Kuiper Belt was discovered. And like I said, we'll we'll get to that um, towards the end. Um, but in the early 2000s, a lot of these objects started being discovered. Um, so as you can see on the right here, we have quite a few of these larger objects um, that have been discovered over the years. But the, the real important one was uh, this object called 2003UB313, um, now known as Eris, uh, which was actually more massive than Pluto. And it's out there, near, hanging out near Pluto, out in the Kuiper Belt, out past Neptune. Um, so this was in the early 2000s. Um, so this really got people thinking like, okay, so is this object a planet? But if this is a planet, all these other things are around too. They look like planets. Are these all planets? Um, this, this would be a lot to add on to our list of planets in school. You probably learned to remember the order of the planets by saying my very educated mother just served us nine pizzas. Um, imagine if you had to remember all these. You'd have my very educated mother just served us nine pizzas and chicken and tacos and ice cream, and it would just go on forever. It would be crazy, crazy amount to remember. Um, so this kind of got people thinking. And then we also have um, Ceres, which is in the asteroid belt, but it's round. It, it looks like a planet, um, but we we haven't called it a planet for quite a long time um, because it's it's surrounded by asteroids. So should we also be calling Ceres a planet? Um, so astronomers kind of realize like, we don't really have a formal definition of a planet. It's been it's been debated and talked about, but there's no formal definition of what is a planet and what isn't a planet. And as we're discovering all these new objects, there's kind of a need for that. Um, so the International Astronomical Union, which is a group of professional astronomers um, that's very active in re astronomy research and astronomy education. Um, they have conferences and meetings and, and networking. Um, with astronomers. So at their 2006 conference, um, they, they kind of talked about it and uh, voted on three criteria for an object to be classified as a planet. So let's see what those three criteria are that they voted on. So number one, the object must orbit its host star. So for an object to be considered a planet, it has to orbit its host star. This rules out moons. So, you know, Earth, Jupiter, the planets orbit the sun, um, but moons or satellites orbit those planets. So that rolls out moons from being considered as planets um, because there are moons that are larger than Pluto. Um, in fact, the Earth's moon is larger than Pluto. Uh, and also this is inclusive of planets that orbit other stars, which we call exoplanets. So not just the object must orbit the sun, but the object must orbit its host star. Number two, the object must have sufficient mass, this is, a, this is a big one, to assume hydrostatic equilibrium. What the heck does that mean? Um, so that's just science talk for the, the object is round. It's massive enough for its gravity to form it into the shape of a sphere. Um, but you know the equilibrium part comes, uh, comes in because there are also processes happening inside of the planet that, that push back out, outward and the forces equal each other out and keep the object in a sphere shape. Um, so Pluto does this too. So Pluto does number one, Pluto does number two, um, but number two rules out tiny lumpy objects like asteroids. Um, and then number three, the final thing is the object must clear the neighborhood of its orbit. Um, so that means that there can't be any, any debris in the way. Um, so the object has to be kind of during the formation of the solar system had to pull in all that stuff and, and pull it in with its gravity to become part of that planet and clear the neighborhood of its orbit. Pluto does not do this because Pluto is in the Kuiper belt. Ceres, like we said, that asteroid we talked about on the last slide, 
Sirius does not do this because Sirius is in the asteroid belt. All these other objects in the Kuiper belt do not do this. They are surrounded by other asteroids or icy objects out there. Um, so this right here is why Pluto is considered officially a dwarf planet or a Plutoid, as I like to call them. Some people call these objects Plutoids to honor Pluto um, because we still love Pluto. Pluto is still absolutely awesome. Pluto is not gone. Pluto is not dead. Pluto has not been any less valued. Pluto is still absolutely awesome. Um, but I think it's this is very important to talk about, I think, because um, there's a huge misconception that science is concrete. Um, and I think it's getting better with time, but especially, you know, when most of us were growing up and we learned Pluto as a planet, science was facts. Um, and just like anything in life, science is, is growing and changing. And um, I think it's it's very important to acknowledge when maybe we don't have something quite 100% right and go back and correct it. Um, and that's not to be confused with, you know, the, the way the universe behaves is concrete. Um, yes, but the way we understand it is not. We're constantly learning new things every single day. Um, and I think that's really important to recognize and a really big misconception in science is that it doesn't change. Um, but our understanding of it is constantly changing. We're constantly, learning new things. Science is all about improving and growing. Um, perfect example is the James Webb Space Telescope. It's the most powerful telescope we've had and we are learning so many new things, so many things that we did not expect. Um, but what's important is that we are constantly improving and constantly getting a better understanding of things. And that's exactly what we've done with Pluto and these dwarf planets. So let's talk a little bit more about the details of the New Horizons mission, which is what really helped us learn quite a bit about Pluto over the past several years. Um, like I said, we still love Pluto. We have a whole mission that's main goal was to study Pluto. Um, so this spacecraft was launched in 2006 um, and took quite a while to get out to Pluto and also looked at some nearby Kuiper Belt objects um, in Pluto's neighborhood. Uh, and it carried seven instruments to learn all about Pluto's geology. Um, so the surface of Pluto, mountains, valleys, plains, what sort of features does Pluto have? Um, its surface composition, what is it made of? What materials are there? This can tell us a lot about um, Pluto's formation and the history of the solar system and the formation of all of the objects in the solar system in general. Um, its surface temperature, which tells us a lot again, about what it's made out of, what's going on inside and outside Pluto, um, and atmospheric pressure and temperature. So Pluto does have a thin atmosphere, um, and also to study Pluto's moons. So it finally arrived and studied Pluto in 2015. So it was launched in 2006, flew past Jupiter, kind of got a boost from Jupiter's gravity, got a couple of pictures of Jupiter, um, and then finally arrived in Pluto in 2015. Um, it is still operational, but it's very, very far away right now. It is uh, over 50 astronomical units from the sun. So what is an astronomical unit? Um, an astronomical unit is the distance between the earth and the sun. So remember at the beginning, we went through if the moon were a pixel and we flew through. Um, so that distance that we had from the earth to the sun um, is one astronomical unit, unit and then um, multiply that by over 50. Um, and we got out way past Pluto to where the New Horizons mission is now. Um, but we love the New Horizons mission and we love Pluto because this picture on the left here is before we had pictures from New Horizons. Um, this on the left is an image of Pluto taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in I think 1996, sometime in the 90s. Um, and this was pretty much what we had. This was the best image that we had of Pluto until 2015. Um, and now we have this image on the right here. So, wow, that's a big difference. That's a lot clearer. Um, it's still baffling to think that we knew about Pluto since 1930, but we didn't even know what it looked like until a few years ago. Um, so you can see um, on here, it has a lot of interesting features. So we didn't, fully know what to expect when we sent New Horizons to Pluto. 
Um, and we found out that it actually has a fairly geologically active surface, meaning um, kind of stuff is still happening there, which we didn't expect. It's so far away, it's so cold. We thought it would be kind of dormant um, and wouldn't have much going on, but you can see um, lots of different stuff going on. This is an enhanced color image, so it's not quite this colorful, but this shows that Pluto's surface um, has lots lady, of different you had compositions. had a question about New Horizons pop up if you want to take a break yeah. from geology. Uh, Matthew asks, will New Horizons ever overtake the Voyager probes for furthest probe from the sun? That is a very good question. Um, and that is one that I do not know the answer to. I know that different um, spacecraft that are out there, like the Pioneer missions as well, travel at different speeds, um, kind of depending on how they were launched and what they're made out of. I know that New Horizons was, at least for its time, I think it was the fastest moving like object to exit the atmosphere. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I it is, and I think it is the yeah. fastest moving spacecraft. It just has a long a couple of decades to catch up to the Voyagers. <laughs> right. Yeah, because when was Voyager launched? 77. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it'll be quite a while um, before it would catch up. But that's a, that's a great question. Awesome. And I love questions because I learn, too, when you guys ask questions. So please keep putting your questions in the comments. Um, but do we have any other questions before we move on to some other things that make Pluto unique? Not yet. You can head back to your geology. Awesome. Before I get into too much of the geology, I just wanted to point out a couple other things about Pluto that kind of make it different. Um, so first of all, it's quite small. So here is obviously a um, kind of scale image, um, computer generated image to show just how tiny Pluto is. So there's Pluto. Um, it's and there's Earth and there's the United States. You can see uh, just how small it is compared to Earth. And then over here, Pluto also has a moon. Pluto has a couple moons, um, but it has this this quite large moon, at least compared to Pluto, um, called either Charon or Sharon. There's some debate about how to pronounce that. Um, but Charon is a very interesting moon because of how large it is compared to Pluto. Usually um, when planets have moons or when objects or planets have moons, um, they're quite a bit smaller. So um, Charon obviously is still smaller than Pluto, but they are still somewhat close um, in mass compared to other moons. Um, and of course, over here, um, they're not this close together. This is, again, just showing you both of them together. Um, they, but they are relatively close compared to um, other dwarf planets or planets and their satellites. Um, and there are some other interesting things that go on with Charon and Pluto. So uh, Charon is tidally locked to Pluto. Now, what does that mean? So another example of a moon that's tidally locked is the Earth's moon. Um, and uh, if a moon is tidally locked, it means that the same side is always facing the planet or the object that it orbits. So in the case of Earth's moon, we always see the same side. If you look up at the moon in the sky, you're, you always see the, the man in the moon side of the moon, and then the back side of the moon um, is always facing away from us. Um, and that's because the amount of time that it takes for the moon to rotate equals the amount of time that it takes for the moon to revolve around us. Um, and that is also the case with Charon. But what's interesting about Pluto and Charon is that Pluto is also tidally locked to Charon. So the same side of Pluto is facing the same side of Charon all the time. So you can only see Charon from one side of Pluto. Another way I like to kind of visualize it is we have this little monkey down here. Um, and if you think about the, the person who's holding on, they're faces are constantly facing each other, even though they are both spinning around. Um, so they are tidally locked to each other. And another interesting thing, like I mentioned, um, Charon is relatively massive as far as moons go compared to the things that they orbit. So that causes them to actually orbit around a common center of mass that's outside of Pluto. So when you think of, again, Earth's moon is, for example, Earth's moon kind of just moves around the Earth, the, the center of mass between the Earth and the moon is still inside the Earth because the Earth is so massive compared to the moon. Um, but with Charon and Pluto, we actually have it outside of there. So Pluto makes a little circle and Charon makes a big circle. Um, and just another way to kind of emphasize relatively how large Charon is as a moon, um, 
Over here, we have the apparent size of moons and the sun as viewed from each planet's surface. So this is really interesting, some interesting perspective. We'll start with Earth because that's what we know and are familiar with. Looking at Earth, this is, this is our reference. So we know the sun, the moon, we know how big they appear in our sky. They just happen to be about the same size apparently in our sky, even though the sun is much, much larger than the moon. Um, and looking at, of course, Venus and Mercury are closer to the sun, so the sun appears much larger in their sky. Mars um, is a little bit farther, sun appears a little bit smaller, but this, this also puts into perspective how far away the outer planets are. So when you get to Jupiter, look how tiny the sun is. Get to Saturn, even smaller. Uranus, you can barely even see it, and we have all those moons there. Um, Neptune, you can't even really see the sun. It almost looks like a star. But then you get to Pluto, and we have... <laughs> Charon just looks huge in the sky because of how close it is. Um, so some people actually call Pluto and Charon um, a binary. So calling them both dwarf planets or Plutoids um, just because of you know how similar they are and how they're orbiting a center of mass. Um, do we have any questions before I move on? Not yet. All right, let me get caught up in my notes here. All right, so now on to Pluto's features. Um, so we discovered a lot of interesting features on Pluto. Um, and here we have a map that is labeled um, of Pluto. It's flattened out and labeled for us. So this area here is very interesting. This is called Sputnik Planitia. Um, and this is all nitrogen ice. So that gives you an idea of how cold Pluto is all the way out there. So nitrogen. Um, most of our atmosphere is made up of nitrogen as a gas. Um, and also uh, Pluto, like I said, has a very thin atmosphere and some of that is made up of nitrogen as well. Um, but this here, this big ice sheet right here um, is mostly nitrogen ice and a few other um, hydrocarbons and things like that. Um, and in order for nitrogen to freeze into a solid, it has to be, I think it's, yeah, negative 346 degrees Fahrenheit. That's not even comprehensible. So it's very, very cold out here. Um, but this is also a nice area because a lot of people notice this whole area, which is called Tomba Regio, is shaped like a heart. It has a nice little heart there. Um, and this is a big, flat, geologically young area, meaning um, we don't see a lot of craters here because this has formed more recently. Um, and this is also really interesting because um, this ice sheet here um, is one way that we know Pluto is still kind of geologically active because we see something that we call convection cells in this area. Um, so on Earth, you may remember learning in school um, that something called convection happens in the mantle, which causes the Earth's crust to move. Um, well, we kind of kind of see that happening here too, which tells us that Pluto is still at least a little bit, maybe not, definitely not as much as Earth, but a little bit geologically active, which we didn't really expect to see. So that was a, an awesome surprise. Um, and then we also have this dark region here. So this actually goes almost all the way around Pluto's equator. Um, and we call this Cthulhu macula. And this dark color here is caused by a material called tholins, um, which was named by planetary scientist Carl Sagan. He named these um, types of compounds. Um, but these are organic materials. They're found on a lot of icy objects um, uh, like Saturn's moon Titan um, and lots of other Kuiper Belt objects. Um, but they're heavily studied because in the presence of liquid water, um, these things could be raw materials, so very, very basic, very raw materials um, that form the chemicals that very basic life is made from. Um, now, I want to make the distinction, there's not life on Pluto, at least that we know of, um, but tholins are always very exciting to find, very heavily studied, um, and it's, it's interesting to see how many objects that we found in the Kuiper Belt that have these things on them. Um, and then we also have some mountains on Pluto. Um, so Pluto's crust is made of water ice and we have water ice mountains that are, um, I think up to 11,000 feet high, which is quite tall for um, a small, when you think of how small Pluto is, that's because um, Pluto's gravity isn't as strong because it's not as massive. So on earth, mountains can only be a certain height before they're kind of flattened by gravity. Um, 
But yeah, so we have some pretty tall water ice mountains on Pluto. Um, and then here again, you can just see the, the hazy, slight atmosphere, very thin atmosphere that Pluto has. Um, and as the sun hits this nitrogen, it evaporates um, into the atmosphere. And we also maybe have some ice crystals in the atmosphere causing us to see that haze. Um, so I have this awesome flyover video that Kurt found from NASA. We'll put this one in the comments for you as well. Um, it's a little dark at the beginning, so I'm going to skip forward. Um, but this is a computer generated video generated by the scientists at NASA um, based on the data from the New Horizons mission. And again, you can just see those features a little bit better. We have these mountains um, nicknamed the brass knuckles because of how they are shaped. Um, and some of these, uh, some of these craters and things that you see may actually be craters from cryovolcanoes, which are ice volcan volcanoes that spew out um, liquid water and ice because beneath Pluto's ice crust, there is likely a uh, liquid water layer beneath there before you get down to the rocky core. Um, but that is the flyover of Pluto. Um, so if you wanna check out this full video, you can check it out. The link is in the comments. Um, but are there any questions about Pluto before we talk a little bit about the Kuiper Belt? Uh, just one has come up. Eric asks, does Pluto's moon have enough max mass to flex or pull on Pluto? Uh, that is a very good question. Oops, I went from the beginning. Um, so does Pluto's moon have enough mass to kind of pull on and change the shape of Pluto? I believe, yes. I believe the tidal is what he's on tidal a, effects on is what he's talking about, like the tides on Earth. Yeah. Okay, yes. So yeah, yeah, tidal forces, yes. Um, of course, there are there's no liquid on the surface of Pluto, so we don't have tides occurring, but yes, tidal forces absolutely. Um, and that's why they are tidally locked to each other as well. Um but yes, very good question. All right, so on to the Kuiper Belt. So like I said, Kuiper Belt is kind of like the asteroid belt, um, but it's also quite a bit different. So it's far beyond Neptune. Um, it's much larger than the asteroid belt, so 20 times as wide and possibly around maybe 100 times as much mass. We're not entirely sure, but definitely more massive. Um, and of course, this is where Pluto lives. There are lots of other icy objects. So here, um, the composition is a little bit different from the asteroid belt. So um, materials that would not be able to solidify and condense where the asteroid belt is because it's closer to the sun, it's too warm. Um, out here, they can. So we have lots more icy objects as opposed to rocky objects, but we still have rocky objects out here as well. Um, and the New Horizons mission studied and documented many other Kuiper belt objects. Um, and this area was named for a strong Dutch astronomer, Gerard Kuiper. Um, he was one of many astronomers who speculated that the Kuiper belt existed. Um, so I just have five objects in the Kuiper belt that I want to talk about that are super duper interesting. Um, so we have Erikoth, Haumea, um, Drac, Eris, and Triton, or as I like to call them, the snowman, the potato, the unruly one, the one who killed Pluto, and the abductee. Because those of you who, who are familiar with astronomy are probably wondering why this object is on here. So Triton is actually Neptune's moon, um, Neptune's largest moon. So we'll talk more about that. But first, let's talk about Erikoth. Um, so Erikoth, call it a snowman, because it, it looks like a snowman. Um, but this, this image here, is actually a uh, real image from the New Horizons flyby. And it's also covered in those tholins that we talked about earlier. That's what gives it its red color. Um, but it is a contact binary. So it was formed by a slow collision between these two objects here. And they kind of merge together to give it this unique shape. Um, and these are, again, these are just five unique objects that I wanted to talk about in the Kuiper Belt. A lot of the objects are just icy, rocks, things like that, pretty unremarkable, but these are some interesting ones. Um, so Haumea, again, call it the potato because it looks like a potato, um, but you can see it has this interesting oblong shape. 
Um, this is because it spins very, very fast, which causes it to bulge out at the center. Um, so in physics, when something's spinning very fast, it tends to bulge out just a little bit at the center. So this happens with Earth too near the equator. This happens with all the planets. But because this one is spinning so fast, it actually, those forces cause it to have this interesting oblong shape. Um, and this is likely caused, this fast spinning is likely caused by a collision early in its formation. Um, and that, that hypothesis is supported by the fact that um, it's also mostly rocky with a small surface layer of ice, but most of these more massive um, objects in the Kuiper belt have a kind of uh, water ice, thick water ice crust on them. So this is because this is actually the third most massive object um, in the Kuiper belt behind Pluto and Eris. Um, so it's very interesting object. Um, and the next one is Drac, which I call the unruly one because it actually orbits the sun backwards. Very uncommon for objects to do this. Um, and is also at a very steep angle. So instead of orbiting on or near the plane um, of all of the other objects, it's actually kind of perpendicular, like up and down compared to the rest of the objects in the solar system. And it's going backwards. So it's very interesting. Um, and scientists aren't quite sure why it does that yet. Um, and then Eris, we call the one who killed Pluto because this object is uh, more massive than Pluto. Remember, this was this 2003 UB313, now known as Eris, um, that kind of threw the whole thing off with Pluto um, back in the early 2000s. Um, and I then finally, point out Triton. That Eris, too, before you get to Triton, Go ahead. Eris is twice as far from the sun as Pluto is, too, I want to point out as well. Oh, yeah, it's all the way out there. Yeah, so um, other kind of other side of the Kuiper belt um, spans from like roughly 30 astronomical units to 50. So it's, like I said, quite a bit larger than the asteroid belt, a very large area. It's kind of shaped like a big donut. Um, but the last object I want to talk about is Triton. Um, why is Triton on here? Triton is a moon of Neptune. It's not in the Kuiper belt. Um, well, it's pretty, uh, pretty, there's a consensus that Triton actually formed in the Kuiper belt as a dwarf planet and was captured by Neptune's gravity, um, which would make Triton the most massive dwarf planet if it were still in the Kuiper belt. Um, but I just think it, it's interesting that <laughs> Neptune kind of stole it from the Kuiper belt. So Neptune's actually quite close to the beginning of the Kuiper belt. Um, so it's just interesting to see how objects can influence each other's gravity in the solar system, whether it's by becoming a contact binary like this or capturing a dwarf planet and making it into a moon. Um, and another thing that supports that Triton probably formed in the Kuiper belt is it's very, very similar to Pluto composition wise. Um, and it orbits Neptune backwards as well. Um, so that backwards orbit tells us that it kind of probably came in from somewhere else. Um, but that is all I have for you guys. Thank you for listening. Do you guys have any questions? Yes. Uh, Billy asks, you mentioned ice volcanoes. Why are they not called geysers? Uh, that is a very good question. So we, the technical term for them is cryovolcanoes. Um, and I know the mechanics between the geysers and the cryovolcanoes are different. Kurt, are you able to elaborate on that? Because I'm not 100% sure and I don't want to get it incorrect. No, uh, geology is not my best <laughs> uh, subject. I'm much better at the stars and stuff and, the, uh, and that end of things. So yeah, I'm, I'm not so uh, uh, good on the difference between the two. I believe it has to do with the way it erupts Yes. Uh, geysers are more pressure based and mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think volcanoes are more tectonic based. Tectonic means the moving of plates and things like that. But, you know, that's about the best I can do. Yes, that's, that's what I was thinking as well. Um, and I know that the formation wise are very different too. Um, like you said, geysers are pressure based. So they kind of come straight up from the ground, like the flat ground, whereas um, volcanoes are formed um, from warmer material rising up from the mantle below the crust. Um, and they almost form like, you know, the characteristic shape of a volcano um, as that material slowly comes up. Um, and I think geysers do launch things 
much, much higher um, than volcanoes do generally. There might be something to have to do with actually creating the mountain shape too. Geysers don't do that either. Yes. So, I, like I said, uh, that that is research for, and this is what science is all about. Let me get back on here. Uh, that is what science is all about, is we don't know everything. Science gives us a yeah. way to study all that stuff. Yes. Uh, it isn't a, a set of facts. It's a way of discovering things. So exactly. You Thank you. Ice between volcanoes and geysers. That's where uh, you can study each and see what the differences and similarities are. All right. Well, thank you very much, Elaney. That was awesome. Yeah, thank you for having me. Oh, very happy to have you. Uh, we are planning a uh, Keep Looking Up 26, everybody. Uh, we uh, have a our speaker and topic are to be determined. Watch Facebook. I will post that event when we actually do have something. It'll be sometime in early May. We'll do our next one. Uh, and because of that, uh, let me have Aubrey and Patricia come back on. And uh, uh, thank you once again, Aubrey, for your uh, bit with the Star Talk. And once again, Patricia, it's been a great few years with you here at the Planetarium. We will miss you horribly, but we look forward to uh, sending you on out into the world of grad school where you will uh, put me to shame as far as what you know. So, so yay, Patricia! I'd play uh, Pomp and Circumstance, but I don't have it queued up. So anyway, that's uh, it for this week, everybody. Uh, uh, we have lots of fascinating presentation. Thank you. Good show. Comments like that coming up, Eleni. So great. Uh, for those of you who uh, are watching, uh, didn't catch all of this, it will be uh, recorded and you can watch it again on Facebook. Uh, also, within a few days, I will be sharing this on our YouTube page for you so you can look them up then. Thank you all for joining us and be sure to go outside and keep looking up.